Thank you for inviting me to speak today. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be part of the celebration. I remember 40 years ago, a, a number of us stood on this soil before it was an ashram. It was a, an orchard, and we were very young, very young. We're still young-ish, but we were very young. And um, it was hard to imagine, you know, how things would have evolved for the ashram or in our own lives. And looking back on it, it's quite, a, quite amazing. And I haven't been back for a few years, so it is wonderful to be back and to see many old faces. I mean, old means familiar. <laughs> and some of you are old as well. And, and new faces and to have an opportunity to talk to you. How many of you here have not are sort of new to yoga? Hands up. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about... Does the sound okay? I'm going to talk to you today about um, the spiritual path from the point of view of um, the self, the highest self, and ego, and the journey from ego consciousness to highest consciousness. So that's quite a journey. And, uh, and what gets in between the ego and the highest self and one of the ways to, uh, one of the ways to visualize that process so that you can um, have a, a better understanding of how to direct your own life with more consciousness and with, with a deeper understanding of, of how to incorporate everything that you've learned into your practice and into your daily lives. Now, just to briefly introduce myself, I, I lived with Swami Satyananda, or I met him in 1974, and I was living with him up till about 19, the end of 1985 when I came back to Australia. And I've been part of this community more or less since then. And during that time with Swamiji, it was a wonderful time living in the ashram, and he taught me yoga therapy and um, showed me how to face the difficulties of life. That was basically what he was teaching me how to do. And then when I came back to Australia, I have been doing medical practice. I'm a general practitioner, sort of. Not really a normal general practitioner. I'm a specialist general practitioner dealing mainly with chronic illness. Uh, I do mind-body medicine and a lot of psychotherapy. And it's meditation-based. Everything I do is yogic and meditation-based. <clears throat> <clears throat> That's better. And um, I've incorporated the majority of the work I do uses the techniques I learned from Swamiji. And I have to say that <clears throat> all of my patients who practice these techniques improve. That's the key. And all the rest of the stuff we do is sort of management. It's sort of a band aid, it helps, it gives people direction, but it's the yoga practices that really make the difference. And especially in chronic illness, the key is to recognize <clears throat> that illness is a spiritual path. And so people who come to me are facing a lot of difficulties and they're facing their shadow. They're facing all the fears, all the things they don't want to look at. And the shadow is basically all the stuff we don't want to look at, what we want to keep unconscious. And of course, what yoga does is it helps us to become more conscious and to face things with greater understanding and to have the tools that enable us to, to make changes and to feel empowered. And the whole thing about uh, the yogic path is it's a path of empowerment. You should become powerful, right? Those of you who know me know that I like nodding. <laughs> because it helps me. Because you don't know what it's like sitting out here yeah. with you guys staring at me so intently with your psychic power. You know, it's, if you do Tratak a lot... <laughs> nodding, more nodding helps. So when I ask you something, do respond. Because I'm a psychotherapist. 
Thank you. I feel better. I feel better. Hmm? Thumbs up's good. That's excellent. Yeah. Any, any response, any relationship is good. So, um, so basically, the work I do with people is to support them understanding life from a yogic perspective, how to bring yoga into, their, into the parts of their lives that are difficult, where they have difficulties. So let's talk a bit about um, what, is, what is the self, the highest self, what is ego and what is the shadow, just briefly. And you know that yoga divides the world, or yoga philosophy divides the world into two main forces, consciousness and energy. And consciousness is a transcendent, infinite, peaceful, unchanging principle. Consciousness is unchanging. It is transcendent. And energy, shakti. And energy is constantly changing. And everything that we experience in the world, all of our experiences are energetic. And we experience them through our consciousness. And energy can be divided into three main forces that are uh, the fundamental basis of everything that happens. And they are light, luminosity, movement, and structure. Sattva, rajas, tamas. Who doesn't know those terms? They're very important terms. Along your journey, you need to learn them because they really are the foundation of everything we do. And the world is basically divided into light and dark. So the external universe is illuminated by the sun, by the light. We don't, under, we don't know what light is, but we like it. <laughs> right? We like it. We like light. We like colour. Look at the sunset, beautiful. Sun shining, we feel good. Light. Darkness, scary. You go inside, turn on the light until you go to sleep. So the external world is based on these two forces and the, the macrocosm, everything revolves around these two forces, light and dark. And in the middle, there's movement, momentum. And movement is either towards light or towards darkness. And the human realm lives in the middle zone between light and dark. And the journey of the self, of the ego towards the self, is a journey from darkness to light. So everything we're doing is about illumination, how to illuminate ourselves, how to get more consciousness, more awareness, more light. Not too much light yet, because if you have too much light, you see too much. And, and that's not always a good thing. So we just want the light to increase slowly. And I'll talk a bit about that as we talk about ego. And so in the, in the human psyche, light is consciousness and awareness, and darkness is ignorance. So, knowledge, so sattva is joy, health, balance, knowledge. The knowledge of how to do things, how to, how to find balance, how to exist. And the darkness is called tamas, and that is inertia. And we need the inertia... We need, we need the darkness as human beings. We need the darkness. We need tamas in the world because it gives structure. But too much tamas is no good. And the human mind, the human ego, the, the center of the human experience the, is the ego. And it is founded on, on desire, on rajas, on a movement towards darkness and a movement towards light. And the human, the spiritual life is a, is a journey in which we have to both ent go towards light and we have to go towards darkness. <laughs> we have to go towards darkness. No clapping yet. <laughs> Save the clapping for later. <laughs> we have to go towards darkness. And that's the thing that most people intellectually understand but when it comes to reality, it's not easy. And so this is the thing. This is, what the, this is what the spiritual path is about. It's about the ability to empower yourself with enough knowledge and inner strength and, and resources so that when, when you go towards the shadow, towards the darkness within yourself, 
you're comfortable. Not only comfortable, but eventually, as you, as you grow in spiritual life, you get, you get used to it, and you accept yourself and your own darkness, and it becomes the source of your greatest learning. But there are forces at work in the mind that prevent us from really engaging with the darkness, and they are basically fear and anxiety-based things that create um, patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaviour that aren't always in our best interest. Do you know what I mean? This is where I really need nodding, because otherwise I think it's just me that has these things. <laughs> but I think, you know, we, we've got this, right? We're sharing, we're on the same boat. Everyone in the room has the same issue. There are parts of our lives that are working very well, parts of our lives that are not working so well. And so, and the, so the journey from... So the ego, the ego is really a force that arises at birth under the impact of tremendous tamas. Tamas, the dark, the dark force. It is a powerful force. It is so powerful, it compresses infinite consciousness into finite consciousness. And that's what we experience today, finite consciousness in this room. So the, the, the tamas is so powerful, it creates a black hole prevents light from... The gravity is so powerful. The egoic gravity is so powerful. The grasping for material life is so powerful that we, we can't see the light properly inside. So you read in the Upanishads, in the great texts of India, that consciousness shines... Your consciousness, the one you have right now, shines with the light of a billion suns. So just close your eyes a moment and see if you can see the billion suns. What you see is the force of shakti, the force of energy, the force of tamas, creating a shape, creating a form, which is your body, mind and ego, and carrying with it compressed karma that's going to unfold over the lifetime and guide you through various experiences that are important for you for some reason. Don't ask me why. <laughs> I have no idea. Huh? You, you are. <laughs> Fair enough. Stay. So the, it's, this ego, is the, the power of tamas is so strong that it forms this egoic structure. And the ego basically is your identity of who you think you are right now, who you think you are right now, not who you know you are. And in the yoga psychology text, and many of you are graduates of the yoga psychology programs here, it's, it describes the mind as having four main organs, and the ego is the kind of central glue that holds everything together. Above it, there, or there is a, a, a buddhi, a, a, an intelligence, that operates, that guides everything. Above that is consciousness, the, the transcendent consciousness. So the you know, transcendent consciousness, imagine I've got a PowerPoint and I've, I'll have a circle. In the circle I'll put higher mind. Underneath that I'll have another circle. Use your powers of imagination. There's another circle. It may, so the top one might be light blue. <laughs> Woody, higher mind, knowledge. Knowing, knowing mind, intelligence. Underneath, I've got another circle. We'll make it red. Ego, desire, the ego that desire. Under that, another circle, and that will be the lower mind, the thinking mind. We can make that any colour. I don't mind. What colour? Black, yellow, yellow. No, no, yellow. Green, black. <laughs> Dark. Thinking mind, sensory mind, thinking. It just thinks. And all of our yoga program, programs are about awakening the higher mind, more sattva, because buddhi functions under sattva. But it's hard to keep that going because a lot of our energy goes into our sensory life, into our thinking mind, and it's mainly the thinking mind that bothers people, right? Too much thinking. 
So the ego is trapped in thinking. You as an identity, and that's, your, and that's a good thing because the function of the ego is survival. You have to survive, right? You want to survive. It's really important. It's so strong. Stop breathing for a moment. You'll feel your ego telling you to breathe urgently, grasping for existence, grasping for existence, grasping for existence. And yet the spiritual philosophies will tell you that ego is bad. You know? Have you read that? Ego, it's a problem, isn't it? It's a bit of a dilemma. On the one hand, you've got to have one. On the other hand, we're doing all of these practices like kundalini yoga or chakra practice. We want to explode the shakti, explode the energy, have experience. How many of you want experience? Not sure. <laughs> Some, okay, this is, I really want an experience. Okay, this, oh, okay. And this is, I sort of not sure if I want an experience. And this is, I don't want an experience. <laughs> Most people want experience. That's why you're here. I mean, what are you here for? Why do you come to an ashram? Why do you practice all the techniques? You want experiences. And the, the point is that in, the, in our tradition, we teach a, a, pro, a process of gradual growth and development. So the ego should be, become strong and it should become healthy, Right? And you'll see a lot of egos around here. <laughs> strong, healthy egos. Right? And as yogis get stronger, their egos get stronger. But strong is good, right? Because you want to be powerful. You want to be strong. So strong and sattvic. Strong and healthy, strong and balanced. The ego under control of higher mind. The ego bowing to consciousness, to the true self, to your true nature. That is what we are on the spiritual path to learn. And so you want a strong ego. If you awaken your kundalini, you blow up your ego. It's like putting dynamite onto your ego and it dissolves and all that's left is your highest consciousness. That would be the ultimate awakening of Kundalini. Loss of identity. So to do that, you've got to be ready. I don't recommend it for most people, unless you have you know, a, a lot of practice and time. And, you know. So we do the practices in a way that gradually builds a strength. It, it brings about strength and balance, and it allows you to develop the strength to, to, to look into your shadow, into the darkness within. And that's been practices like Antal Moan and uh, Chakra Shuddhi that you did today and so on. These all help you to, to build a sense of strength. And in fact, chakra practice is probably one of the best ways to, to cross over from ego to self. It's one of the best ways because it's very tangible, it's very experiential, it's stabilizing and balancing and, and purifying if it's done in the right way. We'll talk more about that. So what happens, though, if you practice and stay balanced over the life is that your ego gradually gets weakened with age. Take it from me. Weakened. I've got a weakened ego. <laughs> the, the ego starts to dissolve more and more as the other forces become stronger. As you cultivate, as you build the positive within, your own ego will just gradually let go, it'll relax automatically because the, it's, if you try too hard, you're going to get anxious, you're going to contract, you're going to push and that will cause problems, that will cause problems along the path. The problem is that you awaken consciousness too quickly, you see too much of yourself and you, you, you have to have the skills to be able to manage what arises within. This is the whole thing about working with awakening consciousness and dealing with the forces that are unconscious. And we maintain. We main, Freud was right when he talked about mental defences. We, we have mental defence mechanisms that enable us to stay healthy, to have a healthy ego 
and to, and to avoid the stuff we can't manage. And that's a good thing. And so over time, over time, you will gradually increase the strength of your buddhi, your higher mind, and your, um, uh, your uh, connection to self, to the deeper self, authentic self. And the ego can then relax, and it kind of dissolves or lets go and becomes less problematic and less troublesome. Up till that time, the ego is bound by neurosis, by anxieties. And so I tell all my patients who come to me, my students and patients, that neurosis is a spiritual path. And the idea is to be able to, is to see that we need it. You know what neuroses are? Do you know what neuroses are? Neuroses are maladaptive thinking emotion and behavior based on anxiety. Things that you do all the time, you keep repeating and you find it hard to stop doing. Remind me, you guys have that as well? Okay. Cool. It's horrible to think you're alone with these things. It's re- that's what community is about, sharing our neuroses. That's what we're doing here today. We're all neurotic. But we're happy neurotics, right? <laughs> Are we happy neurotics? <laughs> More or less, most of the time, not always. Sometimes not so happy. When you're a happy neurotic, your consciousness is accepting your ego and your, your quirks. And when you're unhappy, you're not accepting your quirks. When you're angry, when you're um, doing things that are destructive to you or to others, when you're acting out, and you think, this is not me, that's the shadow. That's the unconscious erupting. And it's in the room right now. The shadow is in the room. <laughs> right now. There's always a shadow. And the shadow, so let's talk, so, so in Eastern psychology, we have higher mind, which is satvic. We have ego, which is rajasic, it's based on desire, the desire to live, the desire to have a good life. The ego uses the thinking mind to plan for good things and to avoid suffering. That's why you're learning yoga, smart. And you have a lower mind, a thinking mind, a sensory mind, which is, um, builds structures, it gives you a sense of identity. You know, you, you want to have a stable sense of who you are. Every morning when you look in the mirror, if you don't recognize who you are, you're in trouble. That's bad. That's called Alzheimer's. <laughs> That's bad. So stable ego is a good thing. As long as it is in balance and in harmony with the rest of you. If it's in control, if, you, if it's in control, you're in trouble and we're in trouble. We're all in trouble. That's, that's why this kind of, these sort of programs are so important. In Western psychology, ego can be seen in many different ways according to different systems. In the Jungian system, which the word shadow comes from, ego is divided into persona, the bits that I want you to see, and shadow, the bits I don't want you to see about me. And you probably don't realise it, but I have some stuff that I don't want you to see. (laughs) It's probably best you don't get to see that part of me. I'm dealing with it. It's okay. (laughs) You're safe. I'm managing, but... You know, it's stuff, it's, it's there, waiting, lurking. And it's here now, even in, in, in this talk, you know. In every moment, the shadow is out there. I'm projecting onto you. Before I come into the room, I get nervous. I think you're, you're all going to hate me. <laughs> I project that. Not so much nowadays. Used to do it a lot more. I think you're going to be very critical of my talk. Will I say the right thing? Oh, my God. What's going to happen? Freeze up. So that's projection, shadow. But reality takes over, and I realize that you're all really nice people. (laughs) Right? Now nod. (laughs) And so I relax. I'm okay. 
So persona, the parts we want to project, and shadow, the part, and the and the shadow evolves under cult, enculturation. You're encultured. You have to grow up, and you have to conform to society. There are things you can't do, right? You want to? You can't. No rules? Chaos. So those rules create a suppression, and there are things that we so we want to be good, and or some of us want to be bad. And we, you know, if you just look at the news, there's plenty of people in the news who identified with their negative, right? Acting out from the dark side. And it gets you into trouble. You accept a bottle of wine. <laughs> nice bottle of wine. <laughs> what, that was a nice bottle of wine. Like, you know, three years ago, you think, okay, how can I get into trouble? Next thing you know, shadow bites you on the bum and you're down. You've, so, so, the, so, uh, so the shadow is all the parts of us that are repressed. The, some of it, some of, most of us push the negative, the stuff we don't want to know about ourselves in the shadow, the dark stuff, but unacceptable impulses, physical, biological urges... And um, these sort of forces go in there. The other thing that's in there is all that your strength, your power. So that's called the golden shadow in Jungian psychology. So you will often, now this could be relevant, suppress your own sense, your own strength and your own power and think that you're not so good, you're not strong enough. Does that make, ring a bell for anyone here? Yeah. You might think that the guru is all-powerful. And I'm not. So that's projection. It's called the God sh- that's called the projection of God onto the other being. Make them a God. I remember Swami Satyananda said to me once, he said, you know, Shankaradev, he said, when I die, they're going to make me into a God. So we do that all the time. The teachers have more knowledge. You know, I don't have any... But the whole message of this is that it's all in you already and you've got to find it. But part of you may not want to accept that. The problem, too, is if you accept it too early, you're going to get ego inflation. You're going to think you're a guru prematurely. So it's a kind of a tough place to be. You know, on the one hand... You want to be powerful, but you've got to be able to handle the power. So there are defence mechanisms and there's forces at work, community. So the community here helps you. You know, your ego comes into relationship with another ego and you learn very quickly that you're not as good as you thought you were. In some ways, even though you are divine and you are powerful, and how does that all work? So this is the journey, the journey through the shadow, trying to work out, trying to enlighten the shadow, how to find that balance. And we, we need to learn certain tools and, and structures that help us to, um, to deal with. Is this all clear? Yes. Are there any questions you have at this point that you want to ask me that might clarify anything? So when you enlighten, yeah, go on. When you shadow, While you have an ego, you'll have a shadow. So the question is, when you become enlightened, does your ego disappear? When you become fully self-realized, so when you cross the, when the, journey, the spiritual journey is from ego to self, highest self, when you become fully identified with the highest self and you have what's called a fully blown consciousness, fully awakened consciousness, then there is no more ego. That is called, do you know what that's called? Samadhi. Which samadhi? Nirvikalpa. Nirbija samadhi. No seed, no ego. Ego is the very last thing. Have you read Patanjali's Yoga Sutras? You should be nodding at this stage. I know some of you should have. I'm going to test you. Who are the graduates? Stand up. No, no, don't. Don't worry. Oh, no. So in Patanjali's Sutras, chapter 1, Samadhi Pad. It talks about the stages of samadhi, 
and the things that, that go. What is dissolved first? What is dissolved last? Ego is the last thing to be dissolved. So the seed stays forever. So even the highest realized beings who have a little trace of ego have a trace of shadow. They have to have shadow. It's, it's, there has to be a, fr- a fraction of that shadow. But it's only when you become fully enlightened, totally, fully blown, there's no more shadow. Up to that time, the shadow's there. There's un- some unconscious part of you. And becoming fully conscious it means that you're able to transcend the power of tamas, the darkness. The power, that's enormous. We don't understand really what's involved in, the spiritual, in that kind of spiritual practice, taking on, taking on that level of practice. So we, we see people like Swami Satyananda who did this amazing, you know, whose life is a, uh, a true representation of, of the true spiritual life, the true, um, you know, and, and prepared, someone prepared and able to withstand the forces of the psyche. Swami Satyananda tells the story once of going to see a great saint in Bombay called Neem Karoli Baba. And Neem Karoli Baba was a fully realized Kundalini yogi and his body hummed with mantra. You couldn't go into the room in his presence. The force that emanated from his body was so strong. It's hard to imagine. We don't meet many of these people. There's not many in Sydney <laughs> that we know of. I don't know. I think they have to have some special... They don't want to be around. They don't need to be around much. And Swamiji said he went into the room, this young man, he walked in and he could feel this force, the Kundalini, in, in Ninkaroli Baba. And Ninkaroli Baba was just sitting there. He said, oh, he said, all these people, they want to awaken their Kundalini. He said, they're not even ready to face death yet. <laughs> And they want to face their kundalini. And so, you know, that was the message to Swami Satyananda. So, and then Swami Satyananda faced, his, faced death in his, in, he, in his story. You can read about his story with his sadhana. And so the journey of the ego through to the, from egoic consciousness, from a, a diminished state of consciousness to an elevated state of consciousness is through the shadow and it has to be navigated very carefully. And one of the, one of the, you know, the combination of yoga practices that you learn. So asana, pranayama, meditation, these kinds of things, they are uh, to help you stay healthy and balanced on the path. They don't really, they don't really deal directly with the shadow. The shadow is dealt more directly at the intermediate stages of practice. Once a japa jap mantra practice is established, once your witnessing practice is established, then you go into the intermediate stages of chakra practice and tattva practice. And those are the practices that begin to take you beyond conditioned consciousness. And for Westerners, I have found that it's really useful to have some training in some kind of Western psychological process that helps us to understand our, uh, our, um, our ego, to have a structure. And the, the one that I've used most, and I know Rishi Vivek may agree with me on this, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll get a nod, a yay or nay in a moment, but transactional analysis, you've got a nod on that. Good. I find that incredibly powerful. Use and, and useful, and I just want to describe it a little bit because I think it's, you should know about it. And there's a great book written by uh, the two books that I recommend to most of my patients. One is Games People Play by Eric Byrne, who was the founder of the, of the system, and then I'm OK, You're OK by Thomas Harris. And the, the I'm OK, You're OK is a manual that describes ego from a very practical point of view by which you can understand different parts of your ego expressing. And it, he divides the ego into three parts, an inner parent, an inner child, and an adult. And the parent and the child form between zero and five. The parent is all the stuff you've learned about 
how to, how to survive, so the survival elements of the ego, how to survive, and how to get through the world and you know, have a parent within you. Instead, you don't need the outer parent anymore. You've got your own inner parent. And the inner child is all your desires and all the parts of you, all your feelings. So between zero and five, you've had almost every feeling you can ever have in its fullest intensity, right? You just think of a baby who's not being fed. That baby will let you know with no, no inhibition. They're not worried about you at all. They're very narcissistic. Feed me. <laughs> so, so these two form. And the, the inner parent is the part of us that we pick up the know-how. So, for example, when I was young, I used to like to poo on the floor. It was, it was very nice. It was warm. It felt good. My parents weren't happy. I couldn't understand it. And they said, they kind of directed me to poo in the toilet. And when I pooed on the floor, I got a terrible frown and, and horror, especially on, when it, in the walls and stuff, you know. <laughs> but when I pooed in the toilet, they were very happy. And I traded pooing on the floor and the joy the unbridled joy of wallowing in my own shit for the smile from my parents. They were right. I tried pooing on the floor at a friend's place. It wasn't good. They were right about that. But they weren't right about everything. Some things that, you know, some things, they, like they used to, you know, they weren't that keen on some things that, you know, rock and roll, you know. They thought the Beatles were crap. <laughs> Stuff like that. So I've been updating my parent, my inner parent, through various means and getting, and just checking my information. Now, the way you do that is by formation, forming an inner adult. And it's this inner adult that's so import, such an important concept in spiritual life. And the inner adult starts to function around about the age of 10 months when you start to crawl and explore the world and find out for yourself what works and what doesn't work. And that's called becoming self-actualized. So this f concept of an adult that can manage the inner child's desires and handle the, the parent, because the parent can have a, cri a critic or a nurturing parent. And you want some critic. You want 70% nurturing parent and 30% critic. You don't want 70% critic or 100% critic because otherwise you end up feeling crap about yourself. And, and you've got a happy child and an unhappy child. And the, you know the definition of a happy and unhappy child? I'll tell you. <clears throat> So a happy child, like if you had a child, and you know that you get those keys with a, the car keys that have got a um, computer in them. They cost seven, eight hundred dollars to replace. They're very expensive. You know, you've heard of these things. So the child's sucking on that, right? That's not good. That's bad, right? So you take the key away from the child. An unhappy child cries, I want that key. And you give it a rattle, no, the key. You give, it a, you give it something else, a sweet, no, the key. It's got to be that key. That's called object-focused. It's the object that's important. The happy child, you take the key away. He's happy. Okay, I'll suck on the leg of that uh, blackboard, whiteboard. <laughs> that's as good as any. I'm sucking. I don't mind what I suck on. So then I'll, I'll play with a plug or the flame. That looks good. <laughs> I'm happy. And you say, put it here, happy. Not object focused. It's not the object that's important. It's the happy inside. The happy inside. So the aim is all therapy, all psychotherapy, is about making the inner child happy. And the way to keep the child happy is to have a good adult around. So... 
What I say to my clients, patients, when they come to describe why that's important, I say, if you came to see me with your two-year-old nephew and you're going to have a therapy session, and I said, you stay here and send that two-year-old out, and you said to the two-year-old, go down the road to the shops and play, I'll see you in an hour, is that okay? No nodding here. (laughs) Shaking. You want an adult present with the child. In spiritual life, a lot of us want things that we're not prepared for or we're not, we don't understand fully. We don't have the inner parent fully adapted and ready and able to cope with things. And so we need to have an adult that's able to support us doing what's appropriate and doing what's right so we stay out of trouble, so we nurture the child pro- properly and we update our information. So this is a very useful model. And the way it works in, in psychotherapy is that you combine that with witnessing and you have what's called a meditating adult, a conscious adult. So you bring the yoga in at that level and you, in your antimon practice, when you're examining your thoughts, you try to understand which voice is talking now. You try to understand who's speaking. The moment you engage from that level, your adult is present. While if you're caught up in your emotions, if you're angry at someone and you're shouting at them or you feel like you want to hurt someone, that's your shadow is out of control, your child is out of control, your child's in charge, you need an adult present. And and you get the adult by understanding the psyche, understanding your own mind, which is what you try to do in meditation. You want to understand your own mind. And you want to have a way of engaging your mind with a structure. This is healthy tamas. Structure is healthy tamas. That allows you to engage with yourself with power, with understanding. And you make a choice to go with the child, to go with the parent, or to go with the adult. And, and the problem is that the parental, some of the parental conditioning is incredibly hard to shift. The stuff you got between zero and five is, is firmly embedded in your neural patterns. It's firmly embedded. You don't get rid of it. What you do is you use yoga, meditation and other practices to build a positive structure. You don't get rid of the old stuff. Right? The principles of Antamon. What are the principles? What is the foundation of Antamon? Who can tell me? The witness of? In, the, in Antamon stage two, witnessing thoughts. That I am the witness and these are the thoughts. And what else? Another principle. No suppression. Disidentification. No suppression. No analysis. Let the thoughts come, let them go. This is the hardest thing to do. This is the undoing of the neurotic desire to control everything, to fix everything. Because until you get to a certain understanding within yourself, you don't like some of the stuff that's coming up, right? It's unpleasant. It's uncomfortable. It, It... You don't feel good about yourself. You want to be spiritual, right? Do you want to be good? I'm not getting any nods here. (laughs) You want to be a good yogi? You want to be a spiritual person? You know, look, everyone in the room is here. You don't don't spend your Easter here. Uh, You know, you'd be down at uh, the cross. Or Or you're just kind of waking up, getting ready for another night down the cross, heavy drinking, right? You want, you're, here, you're here for a reason. You want to be good and therefore your shadow gets bigger. The more light, the more shadow. The more darkness you've got to deal with. This is the problem. And you've got to gear up. You've got to gear up. You've got to find your inner... Um,
you've got, you've got to have, take a very responsible, like an adult responsible decision. You make a decision that I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it properly. You want to do it properly if you're going to do it. Don't muck around. Do it well. Otherwise, you're just playing around and it's going to come back and hit you sometime. But that's part of the process as well. You know, we've got to gear up a bit. And so this is what we're here for in this environment. We come into an ashram like this to, to absorb these concepts, to feel these concepts, to be in the company of people who are practicing as much as they possibly can within the limits of their own karma and their own minds and their own lives and so on. And you, you, so you've got to kind of, you've got to recognize this. As soon as you tackle and just look at what's happening in the world, in the, in the churches, and here even we had problems with abuse, right? Shadow. As soon as there's a lot of light, there's a shadow. Tough. You've got to, you've got to do it well. You've got to make a proper decision. There's got to be an adult in the room. That's the key. And you make a proper decision. And you base it on good study and, and really try and understand the principles and apply those principles. So, so, these, so these kinds of... So then, where was, it, where was I? The shadow. See, the shadow. Can you feel it? <laughs> oh, God. Is it a shadow or is it an elephant? I don't know what it is. What was I doing? Transactional analysis. I think I finished that more or less. Yeah. 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 Did I finish that? <laughs> That's enough. Jung and transactional analysis is enough. That's it. Jane knows. She's my partner. She's looking after my shadow. Very well. And the thing is, too, that with the creative power, as you unleash more energy through sadhana, then all the cracks become bigger and all the, all the forces within you become bigger. Your strength becomes bigger. Everything gets stronger. The good things get stronger and the bad things get stronger. So this is where you have to make a kind of heroic decision to really say, OK, you know, I'm going to tackle this, I'm going to do the best of my ability and I'm going to give it everything i got and I'm going to get as much help as I can and, and that's why it's so important to have these kinds of communities. And this ashram, 40 years celebrating, you know, having gone through so many things and still surviving and amazing in terms of what it is in the world. You know, you travel the world, you'll never see anything like this outside. It's very hard. Occasionally, you know, if you go to the... There's a Shivananda yoga holiday camp in the Bahamas. <laughs> I love them. No, I'm joking. Sorry. They're shadow. That's shadow. That's, that's shadow talk. See, sibling rivalry. That's shadow talk. Sorry. Is this being recorded? Oh, yes. I'm, I, I, I'm recording it. Luckily, I'm recording it. Are you recording it? You are? Oh, my God. See, shadow always comes back to bite you. But hard to find these places. A few people you know, have done this kind of work and really made it work. So we need this kind of a, these kinds of environments to be able to support the times when we're going through. I mean, a lot of these older swamis who were here, who lived in ashrams, were scattered throughout. Like in India, we were locked up. I mean, our shadow was so out of control, they had to lock us. <laughs> They had to put a lock padlock on the door, and we'd be, we'd be sh you know, shouting. Swami Satinanda, would, he knew how to get our shadow into the light. He, all these senior swamis, so knowledgeable, and he'd say he'd he'd put one of the children in charge <laughs> to get out of the building. You had to get a pass from a twelve-year-old. That twelve-year-old didn't have an adult present. It was just how much they liked you, whether they'd let you out or not. So that did stir up the odd emotion <laughs> from time to time. You remember the old days? 
I know, the old days. Makes me think. <laughs> Very good. So then, see them reminiscing. See these old swamis just get lost and rem- reminiscing. <laughs> so the shadow, so the energy builds up and all the cracks become evident. You need, we need to have things, we need to have community, we need to have practices, we need to have access to knowledge and the dedication that so many people here uh, put into, and in so many communities around the world, this is not, we're not alone. You know, there is a, a worldwide web of spiritual communities supporting each other in different ways. Even though there's always a bit of rivalry, my meditation's better than yours, my mantras are better than yours, I've got the real mantras, you know, sort of thing. But that's okay. It's all just part of the leela, the game, the maya. But, the, you know, the energy that goes into this is very important. But the recognition of the darkness, we have to be aware that what we're doing is... We're here, to, we're here to face the darkness, transmute the darkness into light. And the way that works is by building inner strength, by building the light and facing the darkness at the same time and bringing the two into relationship. The two have to come into relationship. It's not about getting rid of darkness. You're not going to get rid of stuff because in the darkness are all the jewels, are all the things that are most are most powerful and most important for you. The, things you. the things you can't handle yet, but when you can handle them, you'll find that they, they give you a lot of... They give you wisdom, great wisdom. They make you human. They take away the egoic power of feeling spe- wanting to feel special, wanting to be somehow better than or different. That force of wanting to... You know, Around the guru, you know, you see it. All the swamis, we all want to be loved by the guru. I want to be the best disciple. You know, I want to be the best, better disciple. It's just the ego. because It's natural. It's natural. Shadow. It's everywhere. So it takes... A, as, you, as you face these things, then the ego becomes a less... You know, a less of a problem. I remember when I went to India once. I'd been in Australia... I went to see Swami Satyananda and I said, I'm going to be cool. I'm going to stay relaxed. I'm going to be calm. I'm nothing, you know, I, I've got it together now. And then I went to see him and I sat in front of him and my mind just went crazy. And, uh, you know, I started crying and I just wanted to be special again. <laughs> I really wanted to be special. I just wanted something nice, a little something just to show that, you know, I was special. <laughs> they don't give that. <laughs> You're not getting that. But his eyes were twinkling. <laughs> his eyes were twinkling. It's Guru and Swami. Swami under. I, I was on the floor. I didn't, I don't know what was going on. <laughs> I was a mess. My shadow just exploded all over the room. He just carried on as if nothing was happening. <laughs> didn't really even look at me. I was just writhing <laughs> internally, maybe externally, drooling, drooling. He just talked. He just talked about politics and stuff and the world and sadhana and spiritual life. And we just sit there. So, so we go through this process of, of unwinding, unfolding of the, inner, of the inner being. And it's about learning to stay stable while that happens. So... The thing about transactional analysis and most psychology, except depth psychology, Jungian psychology does take you deeper. But a lot of the psychological processes that you see today help you to just stay stable, to manage your neuroses, to find ways to be with yourself. And the yoga practices help you to jump out of that socially conditioned part of the ego into the deeper part of the self, to, trans- to come back, so tattva practice... Tattvas, you know, each tattva means elemental forces, earth, water, fire, air, space, and so on. Each chakra has an element inside it. That elemental level is transcultural. It's translogical. So by, as soon as you put your mind there, you're outside of the neuroses. The neuroses don't go away. You come back to them, but you, you touch the deeper part of the self. And that's the journey. 
to go in and touch those deeper um, parts and to um, find the strength that comes with that, that enables you to stay present with your own internal jumble of stuff and and not get caught up in trying to fix everything. You don't. You just let the, you let that go. So that's the key. Develop inner stability. Dharana. To develop a dharana. Um, the other thing that's really important is to have purpose. To have a life purpose. How many people here feel they've got life purpose? So this is unusual. How many people don't have a life purpose? Okay, And that's important to recognise that. To have purpose, is, and I think yoga gives you purpose, right? Gives you a kind of purpose. And I would say that that's the value, can be the value of what you gain here, to gain purpose. Most people living in the world have purposes, common pur- we call it common purpose, work, family, stuff. And some people have a real definite sense of who they are and what they want to do. But a lot of people are doing stuff they don't want to do. They've just got to do it. They've got to work. They've got to make money. I'm sure a lot of you are in that position, right? You've got to do it. You've got to drive the truck up the coast on Easter, you know, pop the pills, make the money. But it's not your life purpose. You know? And um, so having purpose in spiritual life is very important. And having a sankalpa is very important. How many of you have got a sankalpa? How many of you keep your hand up if you've had a sankalpa and you've fulfilled a sankalpa? That's good. You've fulfilled it. You've got the fruits of it. Okay, thank you. A sankalpa, good on you. Are you following any of this? That's good. And thank you for asking. Anyone... If you look, we'll have time for questions and answers in a minute. The sankalpa is a resolve made in the practice of yoga nidra. For example, not only in yoga nidra, the sankalpa is defined as a resolve or intention formed in the heart. That summarize the sankalpa is a short positive sentence that summarizes a purpose or intention. It's formed in the heart and it's made with conviction. And you make a sankalpa, and when you make the sankalpa, you visualise in your mind the things you've got to do to to accomplish that sankalpa, that resolve. Yoga nidra is used as the main form of using the sankalpa because it is the practice that enables us to access the subconscious mind most easily. Most people access the subconscious mind incredibly quickly and then fall asleep. (laughs) And so the whole idea of yoga nidra is to access your subconscious mind and stay awake, and that becomes a more advanced part of yoga nidra. So yoga nidra has got two phases of development. Number one, recovery from exhaustion, <laughs> which is important, a very important thing. You know that what a gift yoga nidra is like. So it's it, hot, they sell like hotcakes. <laughs> on our on our website, that's our number one seller, yoga nidra. That's all we sell, really, (laughs) unfortunately. We sell the others a little bit. But yoga nidra, just going out, you know, can't can't make enough of them. I've got to make more. You know, variety of yoga nidras for anxiety, neuroses. Got to build an empire. (laughs) Yoga nidra empire. So, So the sankalpa is the ability to stay connected to who you are and what your purpose is. And you can, only make a, you, can only make a, you can only know your purpose and you can only make a proper sankalpa if you know who you are as, a, as both an ego and as a higher, uni- more universal person. So there are three forms of purpose. And Jane and I have put together... This is the ad. <laughs> Jane and I have put on our website, bigshakti.com, which you should visit, we've put together... A course. We just released it. There's a discount out there now <laughs> for another few days on life purpose, finding li- how to find your life purpose. And it's about using a combination of yoga nidra, sankalpa, and chakra meditation with some very unique and wonderfully put together meditations that you won't find anywhere else. 
really good contemplative practice, knowledge in, embodying knowledge practices, that enables you to, to study the process of what is purpose. And purpose, we'd say, has three, there are three types of purpose that we've kind of looked at and developed in our own, in, through our own research. The first is called common purpose. And common purpose is all the things you've got to do to survive. Everybody's got to do these things. You've got to eat, you've got to work, you've got to, you, know, you want to have fun, and you have your own things. And you can make a sankalpa for all of those things. So, for example, if you're going to cook food in the, in the kitchen, right, we're going to eat now, you would hope that everybody in that kitchen has a... Their purpose is to make the best possible food for us, right? Are they making a sankalpa to do that? Would you check, please? <laughs> we want... So they should be... Before they cook, they should, that's their common purpose for us, for everyone. We're going to make the best possible... This is a special occasion. I'm going to make this the best possible sabji and so on I possibly can make. And that is, that is spiritual life. Everything... That's karma yoga. That's creating good karma. Every moment creating good karma with good consciousness. With a proper decision from the, the adults present. Not, I'm going to make this... I, I'm not, I hate so-and-so. I'm going to put a bit of dirt in the food. <laughs> that is shadow. That is not good. That is the child without the adult in the room. So, so common purpose, that's number one. Then there's life purpose. And life purpose has two forms. The first is individual life purpose, that you as an egoic being incarnate into each, according to yogic philosophy, yep. you're right? Bless you. According to yoga philosophy, you incarnate into each lifetime with some purpose. With a, you have your own strengths and weaknesses, and you've got to identify those and fulfill that to the best of your ability, whatever it is, whether you're a, a guru, a disciple, a tree, or a blade, blade of grass, or whatever you're going to do. Whatever, whoever you are, if you fulfill that destiny to the best of your ability, you can become enlightened. And the second part of life purpose is called universal or ultimate life purpose, which is self-knowledge. And that... Self-knowledge is, is a key to uh, everything else. That's the key to everything else. And you can make a sankalpa at any time. You can make a sankalpa at Yoga Nidra. You can make a sankalpa. Like before I did this lecture, I made a sankalpa to try and do the best I could. Right? I'm doing okay. I think. It's not bad. It's reasonable. But I'm doing my best. I really want to do well. Right? So I make a sankalpa. I'm going to do this lecture. I'm back here after a long break. I'm happy to be here. Can't I'm joyful, full of joy to see so many friends. I feel so much love. Beautiful. So I want to do... You know, so we make, a, we make a resolve at any time. And then you have to understand the power of desire, that the ego contained within the ego is desire. function, all human beings, the, function, the, the, the center of the human being is desire. The desire to live, the desire to have a good life. Everything revolves around that. You, you do what you want to do. You're here because you want to be. You practice because you want to practice. And if you can use that desire, if you can, if you can harness that desire, if, you, if you've got a sankalpa that is not congruent with who you are, that you, that's not empowered by really wanting it to happen, then there's no feeling. And in all the great yoga texts, it's said when you practice, for example, in the Mantra Yoga Samhita, which is a book on mantra practice, it said you practice the mantra with full devotion, with full feeling, with full desire, with everything you've got, you put it into it. And that's the key to success. And the, the ability to handle desire is not easy because there's so many desires in the mind, right? Right? You start looking at your desires, you've got, and there's, some of them are conflicting, conflicting desires. So you've got to be able to handle that. And one of the best ways to do this kind of work is through chakra practice because it connects you more to who you really are and then you get a sense of how your desire... You start to classify and categorise your desires into those that are most important, that really need to be focused on and those that need to be discarded. Or, or just put aside for another time. Or, or, or that, you know, maybe later. But this, this is where I've got to put my energy. And that focus 
enables you to make to fulfill your sankalpa and to be successful. Whatever you do, do it well and use a sankalpa for that. And so this course that we've put together, if you want to study more about this, you're welcome. We'd love to stay connected with you online. Any questions? The ego is driving you. Look, when we say the ego diminishes, it diminishes in its power or in its delusion. One of the great definitions of yoga is disillusionment, the removal of delusion and the recognition of what's real and what's true. That's the key. So it's not that the ego gets less or bigger or whatever. It just becomes more sattvic. It becomes more connected to knowledge. It has access to the inner parent, to higher knowledge, to the buddhi, and is able to bow. So sitting back and recognising that. that Yes, sitting back, perfect. You dissociate from the ego and you become more into the witness. Antamon. You see it for what it is and you can manage it better. And you're still driven. And look, you'll be driven by whatever is in you. And your psyche is vast, infinite. You know, the, the unconscious is enormous. There's so much in us. Don't worry, you're going to be driven. It's not like you're going to kind of not be driven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tame the ego. Tame the ego. Tame it, yeah. yeah. Um, because um, as the light gets bigger, and you say the darkness gets bigger. Also, how does one manage the darkness? Sankalpa. I'm, I'm staying on track. Keep practicing, keep practicing. Help, ring up someone. I need a therapist. I need a yoga teacher. I'm coming to the ashram. You know, if you can't do it on your own, if you come up against a problem that's too big for you, you need support. You need community. Community is a big part of what, you know, all the great traditions talk about. I'll come back to you in a moment. All the great traditions talk about the three things that carry us over the ocean of existence teacher, technique, community. We need that. We need each other. And some of the things we're going to face are really big. I mean, we, 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 we're laughing a bit, but we know some of the stuff we've had to face, others have had to face. Not easy. So we need each other, right? Don't be frightened to ask for help. In, in yoga communities, there's, the shadow is often that Western psychology is inferior. Yoga is everything. Yoga can do everything. You, do you know, does that ring true? You hear that kind of as an... No. Can't do everything. Can do a lot. Add it in to the mix. It's incredible. But we also need to have access to other forms of knowledge and have respect for those forms of knowledge and see their place in the picture. Not that one is... But, you know, psychologists are fighting with hypnotherapists. And hypnotherapists are fighting with, you know... Um, other people about who's the better system and you know what's evidence based and what's going on so you know there's always this battle about ideas but everything has its place and so one of the things i'd like to encourage a lot of you i find incredibly powerful in my own work you know and i think people see the difference is when you combine a number of things that work for you you've got to ex- you've got to have your adult exploring the world checking out what's right for me it's not just because Someone else says it's good, or I read in a book this is bad. What's right for me? You know, because everybody's got an agenda, everybody's got shadow. So we've got to be able to find the right thing for you, explore it, take the best from it. That's yoga. Yoga is bringing conscious awareness into the moment and connecting with things with full, with full awareness. And taking what you can, a little bit, a little bit. Just take a little bit, and that will help you. And then move on to something, find other things, keep moving. The one thing I remember Swami Swami Satyananda didn't say a lot to me. He just said to me, keep moving, which which was mainly to get out of his room. (laughs) Because I was was bugging him so much because I wanted to be so special. I said, so I think I'll...
I got a question for Swamiji. I'll go down and knock on the door. Swamiji, he'd say, keep moving. <laughs> I remember once I went to see him and uh, I was very sick. I had an eruption of shadow, shadow eruption, and I had a lot of diarrhoea and I had a lot of negative thoughts. And I thought, I'm going to leave the ashram. And I was in pain. I had terrible pain. I was just pooing all over the place. <laughs> and life was tough. And I thought, I'm going to go back. Spiritual life sucks. <laughs> and uh, so I went to say, Swamiji, and I w- as I walked in, I sat down, and all the pain went, and all the negative, th- and all my questions disappeared. And I sat down with him, and he just looked at me, he said, yes. And I went, I just smiled sort of with that goofy smile. You know, Swamiji, well, I don't know Swamiji. And he'd say, okay, keep moving. <laughs> so you've got to keep moving. That was the message. I got the message. Yeah, you had a question. Just a question of what drives it. And I was thinking, is it Guru Tattwa which drives us towards the wholeness and keeps us going through the shadow? And is this connection with, with is this the Sadhguru and is it connection with Sadhguru that is the most important thing? Look, for me it is, but the, the connection to, to the, guru, the Guru Tattwa, do you know what that is? Mm-hmm. Tattwa means the essence of, and Guru means a guiding force, generally thought of as a person, but in this context really means within your own consciousness you have your own wisdom guiding you over many lifetimes. That is the Guru Tattwa. And spiritual life, in spiritual life, especially in this kind of environment where we're very guru focused obviously you know, it's all a tradition based on gurus and guru disciple tradition they're not all like this it's not a, it's not the only way but the guru as an internal process is essential and i think if you can connect to the guru tattva you're blessed then your life if you're really connected to it if you've aligned your spinal cord all your force if your shadow is kind of more or less in in harmony so a japa, if you do a japa jap in the spinal cord for long enough, ultimately your antenna, your, your, the, the spinal cord is the ground of consciousness. If, that, if your spine connects to the, to the universal consciousness and you start to feel connected, then the guru tattva is present. And the guru tattva is with you all the time. It's usually unconscious and we want to make it more conscious and we do that through different processes. So those of us who are consciously connected to that element feel blessed and would encourage others who would like to travel down that path to, to follow that path. Yep. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the development of neural pathways, you think you said you thought that they got completely set between north and south. Yep. Yep. What are your thoughts on neural plasticity? Are you using the tools of yoga? Yeah. Neural plasticity is very like it, it, to be able to change, see, the way that that's been, the buzz around that has made it sound very simple. But in fact, the plasticity is there, but it's not that easy to change things. And generally, when people have trauma, then they're very motivated and undergo specialised programs that can sometimes bring out re jig the, or, or, or increase a new pathway or, or create a new pathway. So we can change. So that's what yoga does. The aim of yoga practice is to create internal positive connections that will act as a counterbalance to the, ne- to the other connections you've got and will allow the, what you think of as negative connections right now to be integrated into the totality and to be part of your wisdom and to be useful. So you, want, you don't want to get rid of stuff because you don't like it. You want to learn how to integrate it and make it useful. So, that, so neuroplasticity is, a, is you know, a revolutionary concept, but its application is still very young. Okay, I think we're at the end. Yeah, one more. Mm. Um, if you just go straight to the love in the heart, when I'm 
Yeah. Great. You feel? Did you hear what she said? That's your shortcut. Sounds good. I'm in. I'll do that. Partly. It's a partly a suppression. Why do you go straight there? Then you have to deal with the stuff. So that would be called. So that is intelligent avoidance. <laughs> but it's only it's only good as a strategy, as as a short term strategy because ultimately, um, that stuff doesn't go away if you don't deal with it. So so in the beginning it's a good thing to do, and you know you can do it now. So you don't have to rush there. So learn how to stay present with your shit. And how to deal with it properly, how to digest it, clean up, take responsibility for it, and clean it up. Dwelling, dwelling. That's the. So, so this is a very extreme. Well, that's yeah, I know. Look, you don't want to dwell in the shit, and that sounds horrible. And who who here wants to dwell in shit? Except I did. But I was very young. But actually, look, I've got to say this because I know this is going to be used against me. <laughs> it's not true. It's a metaphor. Are we clear? Because <laughs> uh, you know it's going to come back. Shadow. Yeah. Siblings. But the metaphor. No one wants to do that. But you don't want to run away from it. So there are three energetic principles. I don't know. I've got, I've got, can I answer this? We've got time? Because I, I don't know. Okay. Because we can just finish here and I can talk about it next year. <laughs> okay, finish. Okay, I've got time. Okay. So there are three energetic principles. There's the movement towards, the movement away, and neutral. Patanjali. Have you read Patanjali? You've heard of it. You should read it. Are you doing the yogic studies program here? You must do more. And you'll get the answer to the question. In Patanjali, he says there are these two forces, raga and dvesha. So the ego, he talks, he talks about ego. The five klesha, avidya, asmita, raga, dvesha, abhinivesha. So these five. Ignorance. Ignorance means the formation of maya. The, the tamasic force compresses the consciousness into, into darkness. You become unconscious. You carry your unconscious. You form an ego... The ego is attracted towards things and repelled. So, and then the last thing is fear of death, fear of loss. These are the five causes of suffering, according to Patanjali, and in psychological principles, a very powerful principle. So, in the unconscious state, raga is attachment. So you're very attached to your heart, right? You like your heart. It's a good place for you to be. It's not good for everyone, but for you it's good. You don't like being in the shit. You're a dwesha. You're repelled by that. And so you naturally, your, un, your egoic reaction is to jump into the, where it feels good, and that's healthy, but you're not dealing with your shit. In, when consciousness is evolved, then attachment becomes, is called embrace. You embrace, hug. You can hug but you can let go. Attachment, you can't let go. You fully, this is unconscious reflex. But when you become conscious, you go, okay, I've got to let go. I can embrace it, I can let go. Repulsion with consciousness becomes taking responsibility for your, for your stuff. So you've got to do that in an intelligent way, planned, so that you do it in, in small bits over time. You do it properly. And that's what you learn in yogic studies when you can complete your course. So, see, add for you as well, not just for me. <laughs> see how giving I am? So, thank you. Hariyom Tatsa. Thank you.